Thank you very much, Rod. Um, I feel old. <laughs> That's how you accomplish so much. You just get old. Um, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. It's wonderful to be back in Ottawa. I love the city. I think you could have made it a little bit warmer, however. It's damn cold out there. Um, I'm, I'm reading from the two books because um, I, I feel a little bit like I had twins. And that, you know, I'm balancing one on one arm and one on the other. Um, I actually was at a reading in Hamilton just the other um, week, and I had two poets come up to me and said, you published these both in the same year? And they said, let's take them out in the parking lot, beat the shit out of them. <laughs> so obviously not everyone is thrilled when you overpublish. So, but the last book I had out was 2005, which was written and ready to go in 2003. So I've had six years. Um, Love Outlandish came second, actually, um, but it overtook me and ended up becoming the, the manuscript that I obsessed over first. I decided I wanted to write love poems to the world. And I really began thinking about ordinary things and trying to invest them with the kind of devotion and sensuality that one gives to romantic love. However, romantic love had some other plans for me, and I ended up... Um, writing Love Outlandish, so I will start with the title poem. He has his cacti, some of which resemble minarets, others something alien and many-armed. She has her horses, furious prancers, weakly rides through the forest, miracles underfoot. So many people, passions, Stamps lovingly teased from tongues. Wine bottles dusted like babies' bums. Sunday painters fevered with sunsets. When does joy become obsession? A friend flips through his jazz collection. The plastic clatter a mix of bebop and angel speak. A neighbor has planted herself in her garden, a shape shifting bloom. And me with my film books, my trivia, my, t my poetry, my ton of trivia, how did I find space for you, love outlandish, first and final thought? I am gathering images of you and pasting them on my nakedness, like one of those street poles in Paris where possibility is many layers thick. I am designing a diorama, a drum roll, a daguerreotype, an annotated list of dreams come true, just like the guy who's mad for Elvis, a house full of Andy Warhol walls and blue suede shoes, or the gal with cookbooks on her shelves, instead of food. It's not necessities that keep us alive, but drawers filled with butterflies, art deco prints, royal Albert teacups, the variety of smiles that have transformed your lips into collectibles. When I saw Edward Albee's play, Who is Sylvia, or The Goat, I felt that I had actually seen quite possibly the greatest love story I have ever witnessed. Um, it's about a man who falls literally in love with a goat. And you know that if you are falling in love with a goat and willing to dedicate and devote yourself to this for the rest of your life, there has got to be um, something bona fide, um, something real. The goat after Edward Albee. I'm in love with a goat, the actor confesses to the actress, with just enough to keep us sane and sitting down. I may be the only one who wonders if the hair would be wiry or soft. If a tail is something I could get used to, like a love handle or a birthmark. If those rectangular brown eyes have subtleties I've never considered before. 
a baa or a bark. I'm not sure what to listen for, but I imagine the breath ragged and sweet like lightly trampled grass, and a trembling that jitters through the entire body in a maze of hums. There's a trick I keep failing at, Love, lust, and longing thrown into the air like apples. A juggler's feet of focus and blur. A balance constantly changing. Smashed fruit, empty hands. The very air an aftershock. How theatrical. I love her fingers, but not her toes. I lust for the way he cocks one shoulder. Longing for a piece of this, a prick of that. Molecules shape-shifting into all sorts of impossibles, one toss at a time. But how can you love a goat without leaving everything else behind? That first whiskery kiss, a total commitment. No pretending it didn't happen, that barnyard stink. The actor trips across the stage, and lo and behold, there's a meadow, buttercups shining like floodlights. A perfect day to go too far, to let the inner satyr out, to strip down to blue sky. I feel so alone, he shouts at the back rows, as if we were a wall slowly caving in. Oh, how I long to be found by the one who is losing ground with every foolhardy step. The lust that knows no bounds. I love the goat in you, I say, climbing on stage being seen for the very first time. I once was reading a poem about a dog called um, Unconditional Love. (laughs) And I finished the poem, and a dog actually outside the window howled. (laughs) It was in the alleyway. So I keep waiting for somebody to bring a goat one day. One of the things I learn in delving into romantic love in in more ways than one um, is that we are willing to let things happen. When we say that something fell uh, on us from the sky, I think we're just trying to make excuses. When you open yourself to possibility, it's there. Willingness. The truth knows its way through my body. This long range of arms, a willingness, blood pouring a spirit map of veins, pores opening themselves to an essence that feels everywhere like rain. Now that I have your attention, I want it all, my name unraveled on your tongue like a spark giving urge to flame, a kiss that needs no practice. I want the soft mound of your palm to be a permanent part of me, a second heart, an extra knee. I want your eyes deep inside, a sunken corridor where even sleep stays wide awake. So much want, streamers of the stuff, a ticker tape extravaganza, bits and pieces of you in all my bits and pieces. When it comes down to it, love is seeing things that are barely there and being seen. The pink of scalp beneath a tuft of hair, a glimpse of madly amidst the usual common sense. The truth knows the both of us. How much distance you evoke, how little change I name and file, the longings that we've planned so stubbornly, they're almost diagrams. Love is nothing like an expectation. 
Instead, a wham from out of nowhere, years rippling around us like comic strips. I want you to stop pretending and start surrendering to exactly how it feels, head on, upside down. One of the things that I found, sometimes you forget uh, as you get older um, that happiness actually hurts. You're the last thought. You're the last thought I hail before heading under, if noting that your smile makes me happy can be considered a thought. And why not? It's a complex scrunch of a smile and worth the effort. Cheekbone seeding blush, chin lifting its small apple of a self. Lips, those lips again, curling just a bit, the way dahlias flex one petal at a time, each with its own will, or better said, desire. Sleep is surgery, removing distraction, replacing you with dark fish and bowls of talking fruit. In my dreams, I don't dare love you. There's a difference between lighting a match and swallowing the flame. Better to grow a fin or listen to an orange shuck its inhibitions. These are things that I can easily leave behind that won't get in the way of writing checks or wearing shoes. Love goes way beyond imagination, wedging itself between tongue and spoon. It couldn't care less if the bananas are sighing hymns or the peaches seducing each other with soft, false promises. So let me sleep. Stop smiling. Can't you think of something else to be besides my happiness? Was that God? <laughs> It was a goat. It was a goat. <laughs> Thank God. Um, one of the things that I realize has been a part of my love stories from the beginning has been music. And I discovered in trying to write a poem about what some of that music meant to me, I realized that I was writing songs about all the female singers that I had crushes on over the years. So if you do not know any of the songstresses that I mention here, you're just like Rob, uh, much too young. <laughs> it started off with... <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, this started off with Patty Scialfa, who is um, Bruce Springsteen's wife, and has released several CDs of her own, and is unfortunately not as well known as she should be. Rumble. Patty Schialfa sings Rumble Doll over and over, my finger poised <coughs> on repeat. Same old heartbreak and unworthiness, half cliché, drums pounding like one of those life channel heart transplants, all bleedings exposed. Why am I so susceptible? Give me a third glass of wine and I'll graduate to Roberta Flack. Those 30 years ago sessions for Ballad of the Sad Young Men. Not quite so gloomily romantic at 50, all feelings crusted with tangles and knots. Although look at Patty in the middle of it, herself still looking and sounding game. No wonder I sing along, beautifully cracked and flat. It used to be evenings with Janice Ian, throat turned inside out, a case of near nicotine poisoning. I learned the truth at 17. Hell, was there ever such a measure? Heaps of hours, dreads of days, the accumulation that ends up history. 
I'd sit in the big bedroom closet practically humping the speakers. Her sighs sweet hot on the soft skin of my neck, hangers chiming above like backup singers. Never alone with misery, I join the lip-syncing crowd, the fatties and baldies who've now graduated to karaoke and second-hand solutions like divorce. The chorus is a choir, a whole generation lifting their plangent voices to those broken lights we call stars. <coughs> Feeling back, was my love affair with the girl in psychology class, or with Joni Mitchell blue under all that blonde hair? Was it Chris I might have married, or Linda Ronstadt's high notes, the way they squeezed into my chest and felt like small, damaged wings? There was even a fling with Brian Ferry, a slavish thing where all I wanted was to hear a moan. <laughs> My mother was right. Music led to sex. Blood <laughs> rushing up and down the strings, fingertips calloused yet blushing. She was wrong about the drums, though, darkest Africa, all those pagan mumbles. The beat was born in my own rec room, the night I wrestled Janis Joplin to the floor, pulses played over throbs, thunder spinning like the wheel of a just-crashed car. But back to Patty, one last rumble. We both know the heart doesn't really break, just takes on ballast too much sad brain. Look at her now, married to the boss, trying to forget all those years of being disembodied. Singing alongside her, shedding tears in a socially acceptable way, I'm worthy of any bar in town. And when we finally run out of guitars and frowns, the silence will be cleansing, death-like in its magnitude. A lament for all the love that slipped away, all the voices sealed in bottles or shoved in closets, <coughs> never to be heard again. So everybody shake their hands and their feet and... <laughs> <laughs> Enough love. <laughs> These, as I said, started off as love poems to the world, but hopefully they've, um, it's a different kind of love affair. I'm going to read you what I realized that I was writing a lot about were other artists. So I'm going to read you a poem for Guy Clark, the great country music singer, and a poem for Raymond Carver. Guy Clark, this was a, a show that I saw with Lyle Lovett, John Hyatt, Joe Ely, and Guy Clark, and it was at, wow. uh, at Massey Hall in Toronto, and it was just four of them sitting on, on the stage, and each one singing a song, and the others accompanying them. And I realized that Guy Clark knew more about darkness than anyone I had ever heard before. How dark is it after Guy Clark? It's country night dark in Massey Hall. Those beaded balcony staircases, the only gleam, like runways at a miniature airport. <coughs> a shoe or two protrude into the glowing aisles, silhouette puppets jiggling up and down. <coughs> and then, a flash on stage, all eyes peeled white. Guy Clark emerging from his shadow, a guitar glimmering in his arms. He looks out at the dark as if he'd put it there himself. How dark is it? Without the plead of moon or stars, it's that pitch of bleak where hands get lost between knees where the barely blonde stranger beside me is a constellation, a hint of cheekbones, a gloss of what might be loneliness listening for familiar themes, 
where even my friends' faces are imaginary, singing along to sorrow they'd never confess to in daylight. It's so middle of the night I stop missing the bright bleed of ordinary life, grimness older than flames. I hardly recognize myself, just another dim skull bobbing to the music, another vague outline twisted around its broken heart, black enough to disappear into a chorus, a brief harmony where I'm the lyric tripping off his tongue, dark created only to be lost to dark. Carver... (coughs) meant a lot to me, um, first off as a fiction writer, but then when I began to read his poetry, I realized how naked poetry sometimes absolutely demands. And when I was, um, when I turned 50, I made several resolutions. And one was that I started to drink. Um, I I had drunk in my 20s, and I didn't have a problem with it. I just decided that I was um, I was reaching a point where I drank in order to take myself somewhere that I was interested in seeing if I could get there in other ways. <laughs> so it then became a badge of honor in 25, 30, 35, 35, 40. And I kept thinking, no, I don't, I don't need to. And then when I turned 50, I just decided I miss, I, I can drink sensibly. So, of course, Raymond Carver was um, in the last year of his life and, or, and had stopped drinking and had become a, a commendable member of society. So I realized if anyone was going to be disillusioned, it had to be me. Calling Carver. Reciting one of those down and done Carver poems out loud as the highway riles around me, all squats and side swipes, as if everyone has had too much to drink. Carver grew up with booze, much of his life spent stewed, and here I am just learning to drink at 50, sipping the wanton life. It's as if I belong in this traffic jam, words stumbling, caught in the cruise and crush of having somewhere to go. Did Carver ever think he'd end up in heaven? What did it feel like, those years of being poured from glass to glass, always a few drops left behind? I'd much rather listen to Tess talk about him, his recovery, but I can't fit myself into salvation anymore. I stand as far away from God as I can, a mint tucked in my cheek. (laughs) Nothing to do these days but drink huge drafts of the past, lean far back, ice cubes spilling down the front of my shirt. On poemless nights when the highways are quietly reduced to pavement, I imagine a phone booth, a little lit-up shack in a corner of the Milky Way, and wish I could call Carver. Remember me, one of your fans? But I keep losing touch with admiration and can't find a way to talk without fumbling my words a slur of love as if I'm tonguing the holes in the receiver, the pinpricks where the voice of light flows through. And I'm going to finish off with, I'm going to read you a quick poem and then a a slightly longer poem which is the the title um, poem in the collection. This is called Where Loneliness First Fell. And there is no real story behind it at all. um, Except that I think I knew I was lonely long before I knew I was anything else. I don't know whether we all know this or whether just some of us are chosen. Other people know that they're beautiful, like Rob. 
Um, <laughs> some of us, some of us know darker things. <laughs> Your loneliness first fell. Unpoem down to your last metaphor. All you can afford is a childhood memory. A bare boy in an empty room, smudge marks on the walls, doing nothing. This is where loneliness first fell in love with you. The possibility that poverty was more than worn out shoes and Kleenex moons. The very moment you realized the earth was moving without you. Neighbor kids shooting marbles, hitting fly balls, wrapping laces of licorice around their wrists, oblivious to your sudden absence. Lives led, lunches devoured, desires bursting into captions above a million double beds. While you stood there, unadorned, breathing one bubble of air. This is a poem about dismounting from a memory, shaking off stanzas of desolation, keeping company with the very best of words. Some days the earth still blurs, some moments little more than dreams. But you do your best with adjectives and similes, those loyal, imaginary friends. Ivan's Birches came from an, a, a, a sort of union of, of several things. One was I saw a, a movie by Andrei Tarkovsky called Ivan's Childhood when I was uh, in my early 20s. And I wanted to write about the 25-minute scene of Ivan running through Birchwoods ever since. I also spent most of my 20s at the Roxy Movie Theater, catching up with world cinema. And I wanted to write about that for years. And one day I was in a forest near Pefferlaw, Ontario, and I walked over a hill, and I found a birch <coughs> grove that I could walk in for 25 minutes, and it brought it all back. Ivan's Birches. In Tarkovsky's Ivan's childhood, the birch trees are celebrities, lit from within with a desperate need to be seen. I followed them through the dark, sticky rows of the old Roxy, aching to join them on screen, brush against their papery heat until my skin was a high-voltage white, my first brazen love affair with ghosts. Today, guzzling spring like someone with a desert in his gut, I rambled through a Simcoe County forest, my palms sticky with buds, counting off footsteps, as if the more ground I cover, the faster color will come. I'm heady with visions of May, blistering violets, and tongue-wet trilliums. Ready to walk until I've awakened the entire woods from the interjections of tree toads to those stream of consciousness snakes. But I never expected this sudden swarm of birches just beyond that swell of cedar across the Amber Creek. A dozen or more nuns in nightgowns celebrating their uncommon love. Without planning, I ducked down in the underbrush, thinking Russia, thinking childhood and its incandescent dreams, careful not to snap a dead leaf or release a scent of greed feeling barely one dimension, so distant from the light that I can't even claim shadow rank, hunched in the same debris as budding June bugs and centipedes with their growing pains. The watcher never belongs, creeping around the periphery of sight and desire, all that white nakedness. <coughs> 
the powdery tips of a woman's fingers, the height of a man reaching for the sky as he closes the afternoon blinds, all together, <coughs> swaying toward touch, glowing with the kind of consciousness where beauty breaks out on a branch or stem, where something out of what appears to be nothing is the closest Ivan and the rest of us come to miracles. Once upon a time, looking was an active verb. Tarkovsky, the camera, sidling up to the birches. He made me turn backwards in my seat, searching for the source of all that light, a tiny window at the back of the theater, pouring white on white, weaving a screen for the birches to fill for the children in us all to bask under, to believe in ghosts and not be afraid. Mid-forest, a pine watches me ignore it as it learns that falling in love has more to do with haunting than being understood. My eyes, my pores, my possibilities all brimming with birches. All I need to do is stand up Ignore the shouts of those who claim I'm blocking the imagery. Walk toward the screen, <coughs> beyond the realm of cedars and creeks, into the pale, negative space of Tarkovsky's dreams. And here, reach out. Bark as silky as the necks and wrists of celebrities who spend their lives soaking up beans. Thank you very much. Thank you.